uh, islands and the uh, English uh, speaking uh, and French speaking and other speaking. And, and that's what Afcon uh, is all about, is about uh, growing the network and building cooperation and collaboration throughout those islands. Um, and we are really looking forward to, um, to organizing this event um, as part of um, the Afcon community, which gets us a lot of scientists and engineers, um, French engineers, working in Australia. Um, so Ocean Innovators, uh, I mentioned it, I mentioned it uh, earlier. Um, we started with a, a podcast and the idea, uh, please come in. <laughs> um, so we started with an idea um, that uh, for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, by 2030, uh, we had to um, support uh, and help uh, our oceans, and to do that, uh, it's not easy. Like there are a lot of things we can do, and uh, please, please free, feel free to uh, add yourself a seat. Um, um, so um, yeah, we started to organize videos about uh, people doing innovation, and innovation doesn't have to be technological innovation. It's not. It's not all brand new. Sometimes it comes into integrating existing things and making it new. Um, and I think that's an, an important lesson is that it can be a social innovation as well as a technical innovation. And that's what we've done through those series of videos and interviews to promote the work of other people and helping them raise the profile of their ideas, uh, whether it's technological or social. Um, so, a little word, word about myself. Um, so my name is Vic. Um, I work um, at AIMS um, on my own day-to-day -day basis. So AIMS is the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Um, I also run a business on the side, and this event is not through AIMS. It's actually through um, a not-for-profit, um, which is um, in France um, for Atlantis Exploration. And in Australia, we branded ourselves under the name of Ocean Innovators. Uh, hence the name of Ocean Innovators brand, um, which uh, has been registered in Australia. Um, so my role here today is just to um, gather scientists, gather engineers, gather not-for-profit um, community leaders, and see how we can work together. Um, because it's not that straightforward, and it's it's not always easy, and if we know who is passionate about what, then we can build further collaboration. As I mentioned, it all started um, a couple of years ago, uh, and we were approached uh, in preparation of the COP26 to build a series of videos. And those series of videos were um, videos about mangrove restoration. So we did interview uh, people doing mangrove restoration projects all around the world, uh, and we put together a series of videos. Um, you may have seen of them uh, on, the, on the presentation before. Uh, and those videos were um, used uh, as part of, a, they were chosen as part of a round table uh, between uh, the, the Secretary, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, uh, environmental ministers from seven different countries, and the President of Water International. Hence, uh, the millions of dollars which were uh, allocated to mangrove restoration. So, by just doing a video or a couple of videos, we break, we managed to raise millions of dollars. So, that's the power of social innovation. Uh, it doesn't always have to be fully uh, technological. Uh, it can be also uh, having the right people and the right governance. Hence, it's the theme of today. Um, so today we are going to talk not only about governance, we are going to talk about sustainable development, we are going to talk about innovative ideas, we are going to talk about your research as well. Uh, and we've got an amazing panel of, of speakers. But before <coughs> I get into, um, into this, um, I want to take two seconds to talk about the little survey you've done when you arrived. So maybe not the people who just arrived right now, you didn't have time, you might have time later. But essentially, here on those tables, um, we have the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And those 17 Sustainable Development Goals are needed for our planet um, to be able to uh, build a sustainable future for ourselves, for our children, and for their children. And 
why is it important? Well, if we don't achieve by 2030 those sustainable development goals, um, well, the planet is going to suffer. Uh, people are going to suffer, and that matters a lot. Um, out of what you mentioned, uh, through what this mini survey you've done, I can tell that some goals are more uh, interesting than others for you. Uh, I can tell in this room, we've got those three goals which really matters to you. So I'm going to read them now, just so that we can have a good sense. Um, so I think the, this one has four, five clicks here. So this one is end anger, uh, hunger, sorry. And hunger, sorry. Achieve food security, um, that's very important to you. Thank you so much. Um, so you see, every scientist here have different goals and it's not always about the ocean, it, it can be different. Um, this one makes totally sense to me. Uh, climate action, uh, sustainable goal number 30, very important um, to reduce the problem of, um, uh, of the global warming. And this one was probably the one with the most of ticks, like better water. But wait a second, like better water is currently the least funded sustainable development goal. So out of all those goals, like better water is the least funded. So we are all gathering today because, because we need to do something. We are halfway through the sustainable development goals achievement. We, today we are halfway, they are meeting in New York as we speak to tell us where we are at and we are behind. And why are we behind? Well, first of all, if we look at those goals, we can see that we've got goals linked to the biosphere, uh, and those goals include like bit of water, um, includes life on, on land, uh, include um, the climate ac actions, and include um, safe access to drinking water. These are the foundation. So if you don't take care of the foundation, if you build your house, then how are you gonna achieve the other goal? Well, it's the least funded one. So I think that's important to mention it. On top of that pyramid, you've got cooperation. And that's what we've been doing through those podcasts. Those podcasts. Because you can't put a goal all over, you can't put those videos just saying, oh, it's just doing one goal. They're all interlinked. So the way we are looking at how we interlink those goals together, well, it can be done through achieving strong cooperation and collaboration. That's why, personally, I put this one as well as, as the top of my list. I think goal number 17 is also very important to me because without those goals, we can't achieve good co cooperation. So before, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to follow the, the agenda in terms of timing. It's going to change. But I'm <laughs> Before uh, we get started, I just wanted to take the time to um, wonder what is um, the Indo-Pacific governance? Um, when I try to find speakers, uh, a lot of people ask me the question, of what is Indo-Pacific governance? Well, first of all, Indo-Pacific. So I try to find maps of the Indo-Pacific, and finding a true map is very difficult. And I don't know whether there are any GIS experts in the room, uh, but finding a map which is representing perfectly the world is probably not possible uh, or very difficult to achieve. So uh, I went through Google and I typed Indo-Pacific region trying to figure out what are the what are the borders. So I came out through this map, which I found interesting. I came out with this one, which actually represents the world a little bit more in terms of, uh, you see that all the continents are more elongated and we, we we know Australia normally is less squashed when we look at traditional maps, but actually the reality is it's much uh, squeezed than what it looks like on the traditional map that we can see. I came up also through this map, um, this map uh, representing here the Indo-Pacific, and I can see Africa has been shrinked, so this is called uh, an anamorphic uh, map, and that's showing the GDP uh, and what we can see is the GDP is mostly on the northern hemisphere. Uh, and when we look at the Indo-Pacific, well, we can see that Australia is greatly shrinked. New Zealand is above, the, above good, 
good size, but a little bit shrink still. Um, but a lot of those islands have disappeared, and Africa has mostly disappeared. Um, so that, that's an interesting one. I came out through discovering this map. So there was uh, this is more for the Pacific, uh, and this is where we can see the different territories and where which water belongs to who. And we can see that actually France has quite a bit of uh, islands in there uh, with a lot of um, water uh, area. Uh, Australia as well, New Zealand as well. So we can see how things are organized. And I came out to discover this map as well. Uh, and this map is a map about um, the different uh, conflicts as well that and the, the areas where we can find that there are some issues in terms of um, pirates and things like that happening mostly in Africa and in, in, in the Gulf uh, over there and near Saudi, Saudi Arabia. So the, it, it gives us a, a good idea on, on where you have uh, transit happening and where you have potentially risks as well in, in this region. Uh, and I tried to do my own map uh, because I didn't find any that I liked. Uh, and I came up with this one, which sort of represents uh, the Asia Pacific uh, region and the Indo Pacific region a little bit wider. And we all know that India is, is, is growing as well uh, very much and is taking more and more influence in the Indo-Pacific region. And I started to draft those um, square and, and um, triangles and, and, and circles. But it's not that accurate representation. But it sort of gives us some ideas on where this conference should limit ourselves in the Indo-Pacific region. And then I looked at governance and trying to explain what is governance. And by the research, the little research I've done, uh, it, it, it turns out that um, it's all about um, all those mechanisms that we can um, handle in order to improve decision making power and uh, help to manage or to regulate better the resources that we have. Um, I'm not going to do an, an entire discussion on governance here because a lot of speakers are going to talk about it. But I think it, it's very important to know why governance is important. It, it's a big word, uh, difficult to explain, but I think if you, we look at um, the transparency that is needed in the Asia Pacific area with all the risk of conflicts happening right now, uh, with all those islands, um, the, the importance of accountability if we are procuring funds uh, through, um, uh, through organizations and not for profits and how do we make sure that those funds don't disappear in the process of allocating them and managing those resources properly with the right amount of policies, the right amount of regulation, um, and, and all of this to support sustainable development. And in the maritime environment, obviously that's pretty important, um, especially for all those coastal communities, um, and that's where collaboration is critical, and that's why the partnerships um, to support those goals are very important. Um, so what sort of challenges uh, are occurring? Well, we have limited uh, resources, uh, we might have conflict of interest, we might have uh, weak enforcement of regulation in some of the countries in the Indo-Pacific region, and that might uh, be the challenge we need to overcome to be able to create um, those partnerships and those stakeholders and this would help us um, to better manage um, the sustainable resources we have, especially in the maritime environment. Um, so the question for you today is, the whole goal of this conference, why you're here, is essentially to answer one big question is, at the end of this conference today, uh, at the end of this forum, what innovative action you're going to choose to pick. You know which goal you're interested in, but what innovative action you want to take on. Um, maybe something new, maybe you want to push something further. And that's an opportunity to have a discussion and, and think about how we can use this, discuss, this meeting today in order to um, do something, pick an action. So you can see there are two uh, discussion area, which will be used at the end of the of, of the discussions, uh, and 
you'll be able to talk with a group of people and, and you will be able to discuss what action you can take and come up with some ideas. Obviously, we don't have too much time. Um, the, the limits today is 4 p.m. Uh, on which we have to be out of this room. Um, but um, we really do our best to follow and, and keep track. And we've got an amazing amount of speakers today. Uh, I can't be grateful enough uh, for everyone who stepped in. Um, and if you do want to speak, and if I missed you, uh, feel free to jump in and, and at any time um, to come and, 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 and discuss um, when, you, when you want to share an idea. Um, our first speaker um, is Associate Professor Pedro Filoman. Um, so Pedro is coming from the University of Queensland. Um, and you all have his biographies through the Canon Advice that I sent. So I'm not going to go through all the biographies in the, in the interest of saving time. Um, but Pedro is passionate about policy and governance, and he's going to help us to understand better um, what can be done in that world. So Pedro, when you're ready, it's your turn to shine. Thank you, Pedro. Great. So thanks for and it's, it's, it's good to be here as part of this um, event. Um, so this presentation will, uh, I'll, I'll talk to it. Uh, thank you because he provided a, a very good context in terms of governance and this uh, presentation will fall on that. So this presentation will focus on regional scale marine governance with a focus on challenges but also opportunities. So I would like to uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on, on which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past, uh, present and emerging. So um, very often environment and development agendas such as the Sustainable Development Goals are characterized by regional uh, scale incentives. So this is uh, motivated by several uh, factors including the need to address large-scale conflicts and transboundary problems such as uh, climate change, marine pollution, biodiversity loss, and uh, overfishing. So uh, today I will use the, the Coral Triangle region as a case study to ground our discussion. So the Coral, the Coral Triangle is, is an is a area that was very involved uh, when the, uh, the core Triangle initiative started back in 2009. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the global epicentre of marine life biodiversity, and where 100 plus million people depend on marine resources for food, income, employment, and livelihood. Nevertheless, the core Triangle has increasingly been threatened by climate change, pollution, and unsustainable fishing practice, among other Threats. So, a as a response to these threats, the Core Triangle Initiative on Coral Reefs, Fisheries, and Food Security Salon Lake was established in uh, 2009. And it's a, it's a multilateral partnership involving Malaysia, the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Timor Leste, PNG, and the Solomon Islands, and aimed aim to address critical issues such as food security, climate change, and marine biodiversity. So uh, to assess the regional um, scale of governance in the context of the Coral Triangle, we'll look at uh, three major categories of contextual factors that influence decision making in action and ultimately um, governance outcomes. So the first of these contextual factors refers to the resource system. The core triangle is, that, is, is as, as I mentioned um, uh, before, is, a, is the epicenter of biodiversity, including corals, reef fish, mangroves, and seagrass. It is composed of um, common core resources, which are notoriously difficult to govern due to the to exclusion and subtractability. It is a, a hard word for me. So this subtractability issues. So um, 
It's a large scale system that's been across multiple jurisdictions and boundaries which raises uh, questions about the proportional rights and responsibilities of, of the different countries, as well as the collective and individual capacities to monitor and regulate resource use. So some of the um, characteristics and challenges um, pertaining to governance associated with the resource um, system. So the social cultural attributes are highly diverse, both within and across uh, other countries, which can affect the levels of common understanding, trust, homogeneity, uh, or preference and interest of, among the, the stakeholders and actors. So diversity it may or may not lead to divisions, tensions and conflicts between different social and cultural groups, as well as between different resource user groups. Um, specifically over the allocation of management of marine resources in, in the region. So in this context, challenges uh, for governance here include uh, establishing effective communication, um, sorry, building and upscaling social capital, resolving conflicts, reconciling uh, um, perception, beliefs, knowledge and preferences. <coughs> The economic indicators are also highly diverse in the region. So importantly, a large part of the population depends in this region and in other parts of the Indo-Pacific depends on marine resources for their livelihoods, income, employment and food security, but also faces poverty and inequality issues that may undermine the incentives and capacities to engage in sustainable um, resource use. So this is a, a very important um, challenge. Further, they, they may be exposed to perverse uh, economic incentives for, for resource exploitation, driven by external markets and, and trade networks, which can result in over-exploitation and degradation of marine resources um, in the region. I think one example is uh, in the Philippines, they, there, was a, uh, there is an export, uh, export market for live um, um, reef fish. Um, as part of the demand from, from, from China. So it's an example of the, you know, the, the, the larger um, drivers into trade and globalization. Um, the Coral Triangle is also a subject to a multitude of institutional arrangements or govern, governance arrangements, those that um, Dick mentioned, uh, the rules, the norms, and the policies and, and uh, regulations um, um, international agreements, and they and they cover um, uh, naturally different levels of and scales, such as international and regional conventions, national policy and legislation, and local and customary rules and norms that guide collective decision making and action in the region. So, in this context, this context may provide um, um, cohesion and complementarity if the, the governance arrangements share similar principles and objectives around sustainability, participation, cooperation, and science-based management, <coughs> but also may result in, in these arrangements um, being uh, ineffective, contradictory, contested, or outdated, or a mix of both. And, 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 and it may not support initiatives aiming to um, reconciling biodiversity conservation and development goals, or uh, another example, reconciling regional governance and community-based management. So to conclude, um, we outline here a few points to support more critical, reflexive, and adaptive approach to regional uh, scale governance to cope with the contextual, contextual complexity. And I think one, one key uh, term is, is innovation. And not only innovation in terms of, uh, as Vic mentioned, not only in terms of technology, but um, let's talk about um, governance innovation, uh, different ways of, of, of um, um, making decisions and, and taking action. So let's, uh, let's uh, in, in that context, we can certainly um, build on, on examples on existing um, in governance innovations in the Indo-Pacific or in the Coral Triangle, and, uh, and uh, look at you know dissemination of these 
these innovations in, 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 um, in um, also in all that interesting industries so looking at the performance of innovation contrasting to the uh, business as usual approach. Uh, <coughs> Our next speaker um, is Professor Stephen Underhill. Um, so Stephen came all the way from uh, UniSC, which, because I'm based in um, in Townsville, I have no idea where it is, but I think it's in the Sunshine Coast. Is that correct? Sunshine, yeah. Yeah, somewhere over there. Um, so. Stephen is going to talk about uh, Pacific uh, Sustainable Development, and I thank you so much for coming all the way here. And Stephen, that's your slide? Yes. Thank you. Actually, I was in Samoa two days ago, so I've come a little bit further than Sunshine Coast. Yep. Thank you for coming all the way. I'd just like to start with a little bit of confession. So we're all marine scientists, marine ocean related people, except uh, so I'm a horticulturalist with a very strong passion for, um, for the Pacific and also for Pacific innovation. And I suppose some of the challenges that we work on, confront and face in that innovation space has relevance both for marine-based and land-based systems. And so I'm just going to share some of our, our learnings and our experiences, but mainly from a very practical basis. I'm a field practical um, researcher. Uh, in terms of the talk, I'm going to give you a little bit about the research um, centre that I lead. Um, I want to talk about the innovation landscapes according to the Pacific. I want to talk about some of the Pacific peoples and institutions. So there's a number that will qualify here. I'm speaking specifically about the Pacific. Um, and I'll give you a few examples of how our research centre is working through some of these innovation challenges to try to create hopefully a little bit of a, a move forward in some of the enabling environments. So a little bit about, let's make sure I've got this right, in terms of the centre I lead. So the Australian Centre for Pacific Islands Research, while it's based at Sunshine Coast University, I'm not presenting it as a university research centre. One of the things we find in the Pacific is the fragmentation of research. Everyone's got research activities occurring in the Pacific, and one of the fundamental challenges <coughs> to doing research for the Pacific is that fragmentation. Donors don't assist that by fragmented research projects and so forth. So one of the things that we're trying to do with this centre is to bring it as a research consortium of research organisations that have an interest in some shape or fashion uh, in the Pacific. And that is a loose relationship or it might be a formal relationship. We have currently around about 100 staff and about 30 academics with multi multidisciplinary in our base. At the moment, it's very much an agri-food systems basis. So we have a lot of research projects on marine and agricultural food systems, um, Pacific nutrition, food, loss and waste, which is one of my um, areas of um, research focus, people and culture, um, and institutional capacity building. Um, and the centre actually does in, invest quite heavily in um, trying to present some or create some research, specific research, um, enabling resources that have wide open access potential benefit to other universities. Um, in terms of, I just can't not talk about some of the marine stuff that we do. Um, my deputy director, Professor Paul Southgate, runs our marine program. We have a large um, portfolio of marine projects, primarily funded by ACR, the Australian Centre for Research on Agricultural Research, um, and FAO, and they're our primary research funders. Uh, most of the research we would do in a marine context is very much about marine products. Um, sourced um, for livelihood and poverty alleviation related benefits. <laughs> so the underlying theme under which most of our research uh, in the marine component of the space is very much around the value adding to maximise livelihood benefits um, and also the sustainability element. Uh, products may change, the thematics may change, um, but those are the two primary um, themes. Um, we tend to work in the South Pacific to a degree, so I'm talking about Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, um, Vanuatu, um, and a little bit in Kiribati as well. So I suppose there's a fairly tight geographic focus that we have. Um, I just want to touch on now some of the some of the generic challenges or more specifically generic opportunities. 
I'm going to use an agricultural basis, but it has relevance, I suppose, across the Pacific, um, both marine and land based. And this is basically the innovation system, or the innovation knowledge system in the Pacific. In the agricultural space, we have what's called the Pacific Circle in terms of knowledge. We learn, we document, we store, we forget, and then we rediscover. And we go round and round in circles in that process. I'll give you a good practical example. I run a fairly large citrus research project where we're trying to rebuild the citrus industries in Samoa and Tonga, again for um, NCD related agendas. We were up in the highlands in Savai, one of the outer islands in the Samoan group, in, in the Samoan group, looking at where we could potentially deploy our citrus, and then we're coming across citrus genetics that shouldn't be there. And so through weeks, effectively a trawling through filing cabinets and through libraries and so forth, there was a major FAO funded initiative that the government had forgotten about, the local community had forgotten about. Um, in the early 90s where a massive amount of deployment was actually occurred. The whole innovation around that was completely lost and being rediscovered. So we now know through that information that there's a wealth of prior experience. So what we're trying to do is move from this filing cabinet situation, this is the Ministry of Agriculture a few years ago in the Solomon Islands, is uh, data resource storage facilities to an online system. So we, we um, as a research centre, we've enabled uh, the Pacific Agricultural Information System, which is an online open access database of information gleaned primarily from non-academic published reports. So this is articles and, and stuff that would not normally show up in search engines and so forth. Material that is going to fall under and between the cracks, final reports, theses and so forth. We've got currently about 39,000 uh, bibliographs, about 437 university theses, it's open access. Uh, and what we're trying to do is try to bring that great literature together as a resource for anyone that's playing around in the Pacific space. How does the marine innovators capture their, their learnings, I suppose, is one of the challenges of the four questions I'm putting out there. This is what we're doing in agriculture. I don't know what occurs in the non-agricultural space about capturing knowledge, particularly knowledge that is critical but easily lost. Um, I want to talk about the Pacific innovation landscape. Um, at this moment in time, um, the Pacific exports many of its best and brightest. They get Australian scholarships to come to Australian universities or New Zealand universities and they never return. And so while that may be good for our universities and our innovation landscape, it may not necessarily have the desired benefit to the Pacific landscape or innovation system. The innovation landscape in the Pacific, the ministries of agriculture, its universities, and its non-government orga non organisations, the NGOs, probably spend more time, this is from our agricultural perspective, partnering with people from outside the Pacific than they do partner with collaborators within their own country. And so you find this almost uh, segregation of capacity. They look outwards rather than inwards, and a lot of the innovation opportunities and collaborative opportunities get missed they're chasing the external opportunities rather than the internal ones. The research partnership balance, there's the business of doing Pacific development. It's big business, there's lots of money. I suppose the question I'm asking here is who is actually the beneficiary of that business? New funding opportunities, money washes through the Pacific from various agencies all the time, but it rarely tends to find the innovators who are best able to use that money in an effective way. There's lots of reasons for those roadblocks to emerge, and, and there are lots of reasons why those roadblocks are perpetuated, and we can talk about those later. But trying to find, it's not a matter of money, it's about connectivity. Um, in terms of the innovation and landscape, what small roles are we trying to play? Um, we run, um, my research centre, a, a fairly extensive um, high degree scholarship program. This is funded by the Australian Government. Um, and it's effectively trying to aim to keep academic, uh, potentially the, the bright academic students in Pacific studying at Fiji National University or the University of South Pacific and so forth, and to try and then give them career pathways to move forward. So it's very much a Pacific student into a Pacific university in trying to create a Pacific enabling environment. And we do lots of initiatives to, to work on institutional supervisory support systems. The other initiative we try and that we're in the process of launching shortly is a supervisory register. So if you are a Pacific student wanting to connect to a Pacific specialist in an Australian university, 
how do you find that person other than going through every university's website looking for with keywords to try and find that person so what we're trying to do here is put on an online again open access register where australian academics who have an interest in the pacific at the moment we're focused on agri food forestry and fisheries related um, type thematics where they can register on this as almost like a an online connecting service to try and make it as easy as possible for, us, for Pacific Island scholars to connect to relevant Australian scholars who may want to co-supervise them through a Pacific university basis. And again, it's a connectivity process or a disconnectivity challenge that we're trying to overcome. I just want to start finishing up and wrapping up about innovators. Um, this Ocean Innovators has got me a little bit confused because I didn't know the backstory to this presentation series. So there's a few things here that may not gel. Um, but Pacific universities, in my opinion, need to be a central part of the innovation landscape of the Pacific. The Pacific should be allowed and should be enabled to be the innovators of its own, own region. In doing so, or, or stopping that, we have some significant governance and operational challenges right down to some of the policies and procedures that which these organisations work. If you are, for example, if you want a soundbite, if you are an academic um, wanting to spend more than five cents on an item in the in, for a Fiji National University, University of Sassabi, you have to get three quotes for every single item you purchase. If you want to purchase an item over $5,000, you must get a quote from every single organisation of business that supplies that item uh, to be able to purchase that, that item. And so we can go on and on and on and on about some of the practical challenges and governance issues to impede innovation within the Pacific at an operational level. Even if you can get money into these programs, I've walked money into the door for very specific universities only to walk it out the door again because I can't get it to where I need it to go because the university systems are not able to manage through, again, governance and uh, policy and procedures challenges. And then even if we do get it right, we've got the constant talent pool from the Australian from the university and the New Zealand universities. Partnerships. As I said, Pacific tends to look outwards for its partnerships, not inwards. Um, Duplication of resources. I can show you time and time again in the Pacific, I mean, where you will have a Ministry of Agricultural Fisheries facility and a university facility right next door with a whopping great big um, um, chain wire fence with barbed wire on the top to stop the two from collaborating and whatever, and both duplicated facilities and so forth. So, this the concept of trying to bring, you know, everyone talks about limited poor resources and limited and poor infrastructure. But we also have the issue of duplication of that poor infrastructure across different agencies. And there doesn't seem to be that partnership culture to look at co-infrastructural type solutions. I suppose we're getting to that underlying issue of partnership culture in the Pacific. I don't see much evidence of that in an institution to institution level. We're now just seeing some evidence of within forestry and some of the agribusinesses where the ministries of agriculture are starting to effectively collaborate. I don't know what the situation is in the marine space, but in the agricultural space we're on, we, we have challenges. Um, the role of the NGOs. A lot of donors are recognising that governments come with fundamental challenges. They look at universities as having a um, particular focus and sometimes blind spots in what they want to do. And so there's been a greater reliance on NGOs to provide research services and research support activities in the Pacific. Now, in many cases, the expectation to be placed on these NGOs as the emerging preferred provider is far in excess of their ability to manage the resources and funding that goes with it in terms of their governance structures and their financial reporting structures and even their base financial systems. And so, in some respects, as we start to love the NGO network, we're almost loving them for failure in the process of doing so. I suppose I just want to finish off with a very quick um, few questions. I mean, how effective is the Pacific innovation landscape in supporting ocean-based innovators? Where is the innovation and the innovators being sourced for? Is this by the Pacific or is it for the Pacific? And how is the Pacific ocean-based knowledge being captured and stored or are we, are we constantly doing the Pacific cycle of learning, forgetting, and relearning again? Thank you very much.
not sure Isadora is not here, right? Um, so we're actually going to go straight into the panel. Uh, so I'm going to bring two chairs. So normally, if it was a theater, there would be some smoke in a room, and the chairs would ma magically appear here. But we are going to do it manually and bring um, the panel together. So for this first panel, I, I think uh, it would be great if you could answer some of those questions that you put on the slide a few seconds ago. Um, because you might have some answers, I would think. Do you want to try Please. Sorry, I don't have high school. That's okay. <laughs> So uh, I'll probably get started, but I, I really want the audience to, to ask questions. But um, if you had to pick one action that you would like to recommend us, a call to action of what we should do to get get started with those uh, United Nations System of Development Goals for Life Without Water, where, where should we start today? You go first. I go first. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I'll be a volunteer. Um, that's a good question. I'll, I'll, work, I'll work start with the, um, with the traditional communities. Um, in, in this, you know, part of the, you can see part of my, well, maybe you can see that um, part of the, the, the discussion around regional scale, governance is that we usually adopt that large scale and develop of the, the local issues too. And, and also the innovations that are going on at the local level, the traditional knowledge and, and the customer group and all that, and people with um, um, historical experience in managing their resources. So I, I think that uh, we, we can't forget about um, the, the, the local level. Um, and having said that, um, the, the problems around sustainability, they are complex, they're multi-scale, so we probably need action at several of those scales, but let's not forget the local scale and, and how to to upscale the, the concerns and problems into a larger, more strategic, um, um, geographic, uh, jurisdictional area. Your call to action for us? Um, well, it would probably be more a methodology um, approach in that I think with the Pacific, we tend to fall into the trap of having a pre-perception of what the problem is and then launch into the solution pathway. And I suppose what we've tended to find is that understanding the problem is more important than necessarily launching into the solution. And, and by that, I mean there's a various um, processes there to basically work in partnership with the local participants as well. But it's that's what we tend to do most consistently wrong in supporting the Pacific, whether we're talking about land-based or community-based or marine-based solutions, is that we come in with a perception of what we think the problem is rather than necessarily spend, I, I would be spending more time on understanding the problem than necessarily relying on the resolution. I think it's about... So it's going to back to the problem, trying to figure out the source of the problem. Well, the source of the problem, or whether it is a problem in the first place, um, you know, sometimes and sometimes activity itself creates its own problem. Like if you are in the Ministry of Agriculture, Solomon Islands, or in Fiji, a large amount of that government's resources are spent supporting overseas aid-related projects that may or may not necessarily align to their own research agendas, and so they they struggle to have time and resources to actually get on the forefront of understanding what their strategic priorities actually are because they're running around providing support services to someone else's solution strategies. And I think that relates to um, what I was saying is that to look at the local level and say, you know, what many of these large scale initiatives, they, you know, it's driven by Western parties and they have the, the problem already framed and they know what the problem is and what the solution are, and then you, you dump into the community, and very often that you know, doesn't work. So I think that's 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 that's, that's very important. It's, it's to um, 
burden of that. He doesn't know where it is. I think the, the, the question of the, 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 what's the problem, uh, the problem, what's the, the, the problem, or who is the problem, and, and who should be involved in this sort of problem. And, uh, it's important, uh, I, I just want to mention, when I was doing my master's, I was, just, I was looking at my books in, 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 in the urban area of Brazil, and I was, you know, I, was, I went to, to do this interview with the community, so for me it was, the, the, the problem was that they, they built a, there was um, um, then in the water that would flow into the, the mangrove and spread the system. For me, that was the main problem. And then I went to talk to the community and I said, oh, what's the main problem? So the community talked about education, uh, health, the need for roads. And I was just, but what is the problem? Like, this is not the problem. You know, the, the problem for me was the, you know, the environmental impact on the natural system, and they had a completely different view of what the problems were. So I think that's, that's something. I think we've got a question here. Yeah, we'll come in. So you've got a new culture of uh, China coming in into the ocean. Now, you know, has it been disrupted? Has it been changed up a little bit, or what's the outcome of the, what's the takeaway message from that? Well, certainly from an agricultural perspective, research investment agenda underpinning what we see in the agricultural interventions may not necessarily be um, consistent with what the locals would want. There seems to be a very strong political agenda all the time. I think there's, um, and it's quite a pervasive agenda as well. So I can only talk from a horticultural perspective. I don't know from marine space. Um, we don't collaborate very much with the Chinese base for change on the ground, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit um, skeptical because of the reasons I mentioned. Um, it's a very complex um, region and then you have this um, vision at the regional level, but it doesn't match with what's happening on the ground. So I, I, I can't answer in terms of what's happening on the ground. There's a lot of um, also challenges in terms of the you know uh, regional collaboration and all the restructure that they adopted to to run the initiative. Um, there's the issue of, of uh, power imbalance, um, where the you know the contract for the initiative was dominated and driven uh, in, in the Middle by international NGOs, um, and then there's the issue of uh, technical of the two countries and the, the, the capacity of some of the countries to participate. 
So there's a lot of uh, governance issues at that, at that level that we need to pass, but um, I haven't got to the uh, operational, uh, the activities, because they have the regional plan with the targets and objectives and, and then develops the action. And that was something that we were um, uh, actually uh, concerned how all of the things happened at the strategic level would um, trickle down to, to the local level. So I was not. I suppose the only thing I can add is that over probably the last five to ten years there's been an increasing trend towards greater um, collaboration within the Pacific. So you've got agencies now that were historically country specific in their mandate um, now starting to take a more regional responsibility because there's a recognition of some level of elevated expertise or capacity. And that's quite a, a move forward for the Pacific um, in terms of that. You've also got, I suppose, on parallel to that, the emergence of the university sector across the Pacific. Traditionally, it was University of the South Pacific, but over since 2010, you've got Fiji National University, Solomon Islands National University, Tongan University, and so forth. So you've got a nationalization of universities um, starting to occur as well. So that sort of is a bit of a step up in the university sectoral opportunities. Um, you also have coordination through, I'm not sure what the jargon is for the marine base, but we have the Hobson Moss base, which the heads of government and, heads, and the ministers of government that meet every two years uh, under the Pacific of Agriculture. And so there's a greater cohesion of, of having a central policy framework for the Pacific. So I don't know, so presumably there's similar sorts of bodies, heads of governments, Marine space, departments of fisheries, and so forth, must have their similar matching process. But for the agricultural, there is that general greater collegiality that's occurring. Um, I think the one thing that's sort of missed there in, in why that's so important is that the, the Pacific is a very fragmented place, and some of the tensions between nations are, while not necessarily obvious on the surface, are quite quite active below the surface. So this collaboration is. Um, it's quite important in that it's overcoming some of those long historical uh, tensions that have been there. Do you um, do you see the, um, the one of the difficulties in, in talking about you know the our perception of problem and the, the local perception of problem, um, but more so on a governmental level, the fear of losing our aid from around the around the world. Um, I've, I've had 15 years of experience of living in the Pacific and um, you know, some of the projects that I've seen um, right from the start were, were never going to get off the ground but they were encouraged purely because whoever that donor country was uh, has a bigger budget than the next one. I mean, this I mean, there's no doubt aid drives the agenda, and it be a bad aid or terrible aid, sometimes it's good aid, but obviously in a lot of cases it misses the mark. But yes, it does shape government, and it does shape government, not in terms of what government does, but what government cannot do as a consequence of the resource allocation that is spent supporting that aid-related projects. I mean, if you put it in a, a sort of practical context, the, um, Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries in Tonga has a small resource base and nearly all of it is resort is allocated supporting donor related projects. Um, so the capacity of the government in itself to, to basically um, get on the forefront of its own agendas or, or explore additional opportunities is it, quite limited. Um, you can love the Pacific to death in some degree. I mean, sometimes a need for a pause or a more thoughtful investment approach to aid is, is, is possibly uh, pretty critical. And uh, the problem with the aid is it just comes from all sorts of stuff, whether it's coming from the Canadian government, the European Union is trying to park with climate change conscience money somewhere, or it's Australian or New Zealand or, or France or whatever. It, you have not only the aid and the, the effectiveness of that aid, but the disconnect of the national driven aid agenda. The European Union won't necessarily tell me to Australia about what is coming and potentially what partnership opportunities occur. So you have, by, by definition, duplication, replication, and 
an overlay. Um, so the Pacific um, has these challenges and, and, and I can't see that, that getting any, any easier or any less. Um, and I suppose when I'm talking about problems in the Pacific, I'm not talking about the technical ones. I think the fundamental problem with the Pacific is it has to outsource its innovation. It has to source innovation from outside its region. Until it can actually solve its own problems and drive its own research agenda, um, it's always going to be reliant on aid or reliant on the money that comes with the aid. And so the central, fundamental, highest order problem is, is enabling the innovators and enabling the innovation landscape of the Pacific so that the Pacific can help the Pacific without having to be reliant on resource allocation for innovation or, or for input from elsewhere. Whether that's achievable or not in the short or mega long term, I don't know. But We've seen through the previous Afram for cafes, just speak and forums that a lot of people are leaving the Pacific Islands when they are graduating and are moving to Australia or they are moving to New Zealand or they are moving to Europe. Yep. Do you see a problem in that? Yeah, because usually it's the best and the brightest and they never come back. And the salaries are such that you can't blame them for doing it. Um, but it means that the Pacific is left with um, what's left. Um, and that's not to downgrade the quality of the academics in the Pacific. There's some still there's some great academics in the Pacific. Um, but that is part of the problem um, in some respects. Um, the Pacific, in my opinion, is no, no smarter or no dumber or no less abled. It's just, for one reason or another, fighting the battle with one arm behind his back because it's losing its best advice. Yeah, so I'm about to throw out a little bit of a dirty thing in there, but it's certainly policies, governance and development. And when you're talking about a clean future, uh, there's certain energies yeah. Yeah. That, that should be utilised for long distance transport, for power. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got an International Maritime Act on the management of some of that material and I'm look at looking at nuclear material and radiation material here, which could be harvested out of the ocean sustainably and also um, put